So, uh, welcome to our next web seminar of 5G ACA. My name is Uwe Rittenklau from Company Infineon. I'm uh, the moderator today and uh, vice chair of Working Group 4, speaking live from Munich, Germany. So let's have a look what we are looking at today. We have two parts today. We are discussing in the, and uh, we get some demonstration videos the web seminar. The first one is about uh, industrial robotics fueled by 5G. And this is about uh, 5G smart testbed in Chista, uh, which you have heard already in the last seminar if you have joined. And we have there are two speakers, presenters. This Onion from ABB, live from, and this maybe is wrong, uh, explained Westeras. You can correct it later and from Sweden. And we have Peter. Also from uh, this case from Ericsson, live from Uelia. Maybe that's also wrong from Sweden, but uh, two times from Sweden. And uh, you will have then later uh, the second part uh, from 5G Industry Campus Europe. It's also research infrastructure for 5G production from uh, uh, Niels and Bart. Uh, but this will be the second part. Um, after the first is done, the speakers, as I said, are Niels from Fraunhofer, uh, live from Aachen in Germany, and Bart from Ericsson, live from uh, Aachen in Germany. We will now go to the live polls, and I will start with live poll number one. And this is a general one that you learn about this, they will later on more. Uh, the first question is, we are asking always which stakeholder group you are belonging to. And we say, yeah, ICT, OT, Academia, and others, uh, ICT, so it should be the uh, companies which are working on the networking, um, either from the network or the, the market itself. The OTs uh, uh, are the ones which are usually using this uh, for collaboration technology. So please feel free on the right side to mark one of them, and we will show you live then the results. Uh, in a few seconds. Okay, here we have the results. So, oh, today that's a quite interesting mix. So we have uh, the majority from OT. That's the first time ever, I would say, in this uh, web sem in this seminar or series since last year. 33 percent, uh, ICT 31, Academia 17, and others 19. So very interesting, very good, I would say. We come then to the next poll, I guess. Yeah, number two is also a set uh, general information that you get used to it, which region you're coming from. So uh, maybe it's now uh, 3 p.m. afternoon European Central Time. So let's see where you're coming from. But here is the usual result, I would say. Um, currently, we have many uh, users from Europe, 87% uh, and 9% from Asia. And uh, so, good evening there and good morning to North America with 4%. And with this, uh, we will start now the sessions. And we will start, as I said, with part one. Um, and here I welcome the two speakers again. So you can take over now for your presentation. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I would also like to welcome all of you listening in uh, on the behalf of uh, Peter and me. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, uh, we are going to uh, uh, summarize uh, main achievements and share some uh, technical insights uh, in the work uh, done around uh, 5G smart uh, testbed uh, at Ericsson Smart uh, Factory uh, in Shista uh, in, in Sweden. So uh, uh, some of you joining uh, last uh, webinar uh, uh, 5G Smart uh, is a European project where specifically uh, ABB and Ericsson uh, are working together on, on uh, a twofold objective. So one is to uh, implement uh, uh, advanced use cases uh, in uh, a factory automation domain and also in monitoring and maintenance, uh, which uh, rely uh, on the area of uh, industrial robotics. Uh, the second part of the objective is to uh, uh, evaluate uh, 5G connectivity and other uh, capabilities of 5G and then to see uh, uh, how well they conform uh, to the requirements uh, of these uh, 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 three use cases. Uh, next slide, please. 
Um, so uh, when when we were uh, designing uh, uh, the the use cases uh, in this industrial robotics domain, we were actually uh, aiming to capture uh, uh, some of the key trends uh, which are done as, uh, which are present in uh, 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 general uh, digitalization of industries. And uh, for instance, uh, 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 on the increased requirements uh, regarding uh, um, improving uh, flexibility of production and manufacturing. So in that sense, uh, we uh, we actually also wanted to uh, 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 address and capture some of the, of the trends uh, which pertain to uh, industrial robotics. And here actually we have a, a few trends which are now very uh, 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 very much popular in the domain. So for instance, uh, one, one trend relates to uh, uh, making the, the general uh, installation and use of industrial robots uh, as simple as, as possible. So for, uh, there we're looking at uh, 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 different ways where, for instance, commissioning engineers uh, could uh, uh, basically teach, uh, uh, for instance, a station robot arm to perform certain tasks in, in, instead of instead of uh, writing uh, 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 by themselves uh, 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 multiple lines of, of program code. Then, on the other hand, and this is uh, also very, very much emphasized, is um, uh, uh, the increased in co collaboration on, on factory floors between robots uh, and especially uh, uh, human workers. So human workers uh, more and more uh, uh, share uh, 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 workplaces uh, together, which basically uh, calls for uh, robots uh, to be uh, more and more autonomous and more and more adaptive uh, uh, to, the, to the environment uh, the, that surrounds them. And then also uh, there is a, there is a very general trend uh, around digitalization of industrial robotics. So basically uh, allowing uh, robots uh, uh, to exploit technologies which allow them not just to communicate among each other, but also to communicate and take, take advantage of information coming from, from other equipment and other machinery on the factory floor, but also to exploit uh, different technologies. So for instance, uh, uh, technologies relating to uh, uh, edge and cloud computing paradigms. Uh, uh, next slide, please. And then basically, uh, you can go next slide, please. And then uh, basically, we 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 captured uh, uh, all these trends in in uh, in the three different uh, use cases, which are listed uh, here uh, on the right side of the slide. And these uh, these three use cases, uh, they basically encompass uh, different features from industrial robotics domain, uh, going from. Um, uh, 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 the different features of autonomous robot uh, management and control uh, uh, over to uh, uh, interaction, not just between the robots, but also between uh, 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 different types of robots and uh, human workers, all the way to exploiting uh, uh, different adv advanced ways of visualizing information uh, uh, on the robots coming from the, from the factory floor itself. Uh, on the left, uh, on the left side of the slide, uh, you can see a, a high-level overview of the reference setup for the three use cases. So uh, uh, I would like to emphasize three different uh, distinctive features of the setup. So uh, uh, as expected, uh, one feature is that basically all all our end devices uh, they are connected uh, over 5G. Uh, uh, towards the rest of the infrastructure, uh, either having a native 5G connectivity, like uh, like is the case uh, with this uh, uh, 5G enabled smartphone, or uh, using different types of 5G gateways and routers to uh, maybe give a, a mobile robot platform or, or two stationary robot arms in the bottom of the slide, uh, giving them uh, opportunity to also uh, communicate over over 5G uh, with with the rest of the infrastructure. And uh, then the, the, the second the distinctive feature of this uh, setup is uh, that all key uh, uh, parts of, of robot controller or, or, and management, they actually been uh, off boarded uh, from the robots themselves and then and then located in the, in the uh, on premise uh, uh, edge cloud, uh, which is used, for instance, uh, uh, to to run a complete uh, a navigation stack uh, when we when we uh, move a mobile robot platform uh, uh, in 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 the physical environment, but also for instance uh, we do uh, a complete uh, uh, a motion planning uh, which then governs the move of of these two uh, uh, robot arms. Uh, 
And then the third distinctive feature is uh, shown in the middle of the of the figure. Uh, we actually have a, a, a kind of a decouple or, or, or decentralized uh, a machine vision system, uh, which uh, which has camera which overlook uh, the, the 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 test beds uh, or the testing area, and uh, uh, where we have a, a machine vision system which then uh, uh, is used as a common component to support uh, different uh, uh, robot task operations. Next slide, please. So now, now I would I would guide you briefly through uh, 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 main uh, results of the of the development of the three use cases. So first, we'll start with the use case which revolves around uh, human uh, real time uh, human robot interaction over 5G. So uh, this has been uh, uh, delivered uh, by implementing uh, a so called uh, lead through teaching. Uh, by a contactless demonstration, where, for instance, a, a human worker uh, can 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 teach uh, uh, a stationary robot arm to perform uh, a tasks. For instance, a, a operation of uh, picking and placing uh, uh, an object. And uh, uh, on the left, you see uh, a figure which uh, summarizes the the setup. And then on the right, uh, you will see. Uh, you will see a, a video which shows uh, a research prototype of this use case uh, in action. Um, so, uh, what, what is the essence of this uh, uh, of this use case? So, basically, we use uh, the video camera on the left uh, to to track the object which needs to be pick and placed, and then uh, we also have a, a marker on the robot arm, uh, which uh, we uh, uh, track uh, with uh, with a 5G enabled uh, uh, smartphone. So, 5G smart 5G enabled smartphone is used to basically do the teaching contactless teaching of this pick and place operation. What, uh, what we use the smartphone is basically we used it to, to track uh, the marker on the robot arm, and which gives us uh, the ability to estimate uh, uh, orientation and position of the of the arm in, in, in space, and then to uh, send these estimations uh, over 5G to the uh, to the edge uh, edge cloud, where where then uh, uh, this uh, motion planning function uses this uh, uh, pose estimations to basically produce uh, velocity commands, which then govern uh, uh, the move of the robot arm. These velocity commands are also sent uh, over 5G, and this is basically uh, used uh, for the for the human worker doing the teaching, uh, so that, that he or she can actually see how uh, uh, immediately in real time how how well uh, uh, the 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 robot arm uh, is actually executing the 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 the, uh, the task that is being uh, that is being taught. Uh, we can move to the next slide, please. Uh, uh, then we have uh, we have another uh, uh, a bit more complex uh, use case because it actually incorporates uh, uh, different uh, features of, of uh, uh, robot uh, robot control. So uh, here uh, we can we can uh, uh, illustrate this uh, this uh, this use case on on a, on a very on a very uh, um, uh, um, uh, illustrative uh, 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 demo scenario uh, where we basically use these different features uh, to have our mobile robot platform. Uh, go between uh, these uh, two uh, workstations with uh, fixed uh, robot arms, and then and then uh, transport uh, a, a certain object uh, between uh, uh, these two workstations, where basically uh, robot arms uh, are then used to uh, uh, pick and uh, pick and place an object either from the mobile robot platform itself, or uh, uh, from the workstation, uh, and then putting an object uh, on top of the uh, mobile robot platform. So here we actually have a three distinct uh, part of this demo scenario where we have a mobile robot navigation where from edge clouds uh, we are navigating uh, uh, the, the, the mobile platform between the, these two workstations. Uh, uh, then uh, the other the other feature is the so-called uh, vision assisted uh, uh, mobile robot docking where we basically uh, 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 rely on this uh, uh, machine vision system to uh, uh, and uh, and uh, uh, some some uh, control algorithm uh, running in in edge cloud to basically uh, park uh, a mobile robot platform uh, very close uh, to the to the uh, workstation with uh, with a fixed uh, uh, robot arm and then th the third uh, third feature is uh, uh, vision assisted execution of a uh, 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 pick and place operation where with the same uh, 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 machine vision uh, system uh, we are actually helping the robot arm to execute uh, 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 a pick and place uh, operation of the of the uh, uh, of the object uh, we can now move to the uh, uh, next slide uh, where where we can where we can uh, show on the left uh, a video 
uh, 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 from our uh, from our research uh, prototype. Um, uh, so uh, first, uh, uh, you see uh, mobile road navigation in action, uh, which which also shows uh, hopefully that uh, our mobile robots uh, can uh, also navigate uh, around uh, uh, a human which which uh, suddenly appears as an obstacle uh, uh, to its path. So here, here we can say that uh, uh, for this part of uh, scenario, we are all only using leader scanners on board the platform for uh, the robot to perceive the environment around it. Then, after reaching a certain uh, uh, position, uh, then then we start with the uh, 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 vision assisted docking, where we use the marker uh, on board uh, the uh, the mobile robots to basically park uh, the mobile robot in a very precise uh, position uh, or pose next to uh, next to the workstation and then uh, uh, on the on the on the third uh, third feature uh, we have uh, we have a, a vision assisted execution of pick and place operation where uh, by using uh, this same cameras uh, we uh, we actually track uh, the object and then the navigate uh, navigate uh, the, the the robot arm to actually uh, uh, pick an object uh, in this case from the from the robot workstation and then place it uh, uh, on uh, on on top of the uh, transportation plane uh, uh, on uh, on uh, mobile mobile robot platform. So uh, all all this is is important to emphasize again. All this all this uh, control is uh, being done uh, uh, from from edge uh, and uh, over over five G connectivity. We can go to the next slide, please. And then we are also coming to the to the third uh, uh, use case. Uh, uh, this use case basically revolves around uh, uh, advanced visualization features uh, for uh, factory floor. So here specifically, uh, uh, we assume a, a human uh, a human workers or human technicians being equipped with uh, with uh, uh, air headsets. Uh, which uh, which allows them uh, to to see uh, uh, the environment of the factory floor, and and here we have a we have a, a prototype application which which uh, uh, helps uh, a human technician to uh, exploit uh, uh, advanced uh, in, uh, interaction means of uh, of augmented reality. Uh, uh, and uh, basically help uh, uh, him or her do some uh, uh, maintenance and monitoring tasks uh, uh, on the factory floor. So more specifically, this prototype application allows uh, uh, AR user to uh, basically uh, look at uh, a robot arm and then using a marker to basically detect uh, a specific robot arm uh, uh, unit uh, 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 of interest, and then to fetch uh, uh, information over 5G uh, on on the on the operational and health status of of a robot arm. In this case, um, uh, this this operational health status information might include uh, data around the CPU loads uh, of the robot arm controller, or or for instance, uh, its its uh, its uh, uh, average uh, or or peak uh, 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 consumption of, of of energy. Uh, and next to that, uh, the, the, this product application also shows uh, or, or also incorporates uh, different uh, means to actually uh, train uh, uh, a human worker to actually uh, use uh, uh, the, the robot arm. For instance, it has a, it has a, a 3D hologram which then shows uh, 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 this robot arm uh, uh, in 3D world and allows the, the user to inspect uh, the, the hologram uh, by using uh, AR means. And uh, before before I give the floor to to Peter, uh, we also have uh, uh, one of the poll questions coming up next, so we can we can move to the next slide. So uh, uh, th this is a this is a, a, a poll question uh, from from our side. Uh, so uh, 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 a general question saying that uh, uh, we would like to know uh, uh, when do you estimate uh, the need uh, for uh, uh, 5G connected uh, robots? So uh, uh, any type of industrial robots, both stationary and mobile, on the factory floors that they would actually run with 5G support uh, on factory floors. So would this would this be uh, uh, anywhere between uh, zero and two years? Would it be in the two to five years time period, or or, or do you see uh, this happening uh, in the period of more than five years? So please uh, uh, submit your answers, and we are looking forward to seeing your uh, your views. Okay, very good. That's uh, very interesting. So uh, uh, a majority of participants voted that uh, it uh, it will be uh, two to five years when when uh, robots would be running over five gen factory floors. Thank you so much uh, for listening, and now I will take uh, give the floor. Sorry to to Peter.
Thank you very much, uh, and uh, thanks for responding to the poll. Um, my name is Peter De Bruyne. I work at Ericsson Research in Sweden, based in uh, Luleå, northern Sweden. I'm focusing on how 5G can be utilized in industry settings and how to build a new ecosystem for this. So uh, let's have a new, uh, let's have a closer look at how we have integrated the different parts uh, in this use case setup uh, with the 5G connectivity and the edge cloud. So uh, if you see those uh, uh, dotted blue lines, they indicate, uh, uh, as you can see, that all the robots, both the stationary ones and the, 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 the mobile robot, the AGV, are separately connected over wireless and 5G. Uh, uh, for all the robots, we're using a small 5G router, and um, I guess in the future, uh, probably in the two to five years that you responded, uh, we probably uh, see 5G modems uh, integrated into the robot themselves. Uh, similarly, in this setup, the AR headset is also connected to its own uh, 5G router. Uh, it will take some time to have the 5G uh, integrated in, in the small headset, but uh, we, we expect that to happen uh, probably in the two to five year time span as well. Uh, as mentioned, the lead through teaching, uh, that is an application that is running on a normal 5G smartphone and uh, it uses the camera and the gyro and all the other things normally built into a smartphone. Uh, uh, we think that uh, both the lead through lead through teaching and the AR applications are a bit unique. Uh, uh, as you can see by the blue uh, blue lines here, uh, they actually use two wireless hops. Uh, so the uh, both the smartphone and, and, and the uh, AR headset are actually accessing uh, data in uh, in the stationary robots, uh, which means that this data is accessed from the controller to the 5G network, and then from the 5G network uh, to uh, to the AR, uh, for instance. Um, so this is this is a bit more complicated, uh, but it's interesting to see that uh, you can actually make everything wireless. Uh, the machine vision system is uh, connected over the wired network, uh, primarily since we we see that this would be part of the of the fixed uh, infrastructure. Next, please. Uh, so here you can see some details of the two different networks we have utilized in the project. Uh, so due to the difficult situation with the pandemic and all, uh, and, and, and the related restrictions, uh, we could actually utilize a separate 5G network at ABB, at ABB premises in Westeros, uh, for ABB to develop and, and verify all the use cases. This was, was quite uh, useful, of course. So the Westeros network uh, that operates on so-called mid-band spectrum, uh, in this case, a test license on the 3.6 gigahertz uh, band. Uh, it is using, as you can see in the picture, uh, it's using the Ericsson radio dot system, uh, both for the 5, 4G and 5G parts. Uh, you can almost guess why it's called a dot. So the size of these radios is like an uh, oversized smoke detector and then they transmit at, uh, at low output power. Uh, the Shista network uses a different type of radio uh, and it is also operating on high band or millimeter wave spectrum. Uh, this is also a test license at 28 gigahertz. Uh, and uh, Interesting to note is that both the networks are true NPNs, uh, so non-public networks. They're fully localized on premises. All the network equipment on site, uh, including the uh, edge cloud servers. Uh, when it comes to 5G non-standalone and uh, the, the interaction between 4G and 5G, I think we will uh, have a different uh, uh, seminar on that. So we can take the next slide, please. Uh, finally, I just wanted to take the opportunity to discuss a little bit about the choice of uh, millimeter wave spectrum in, in uh, Shista. Uh, and I have tried to illustrate this in this uh, colorful picture. Uh, so uh, both the so-called mid band and the high band or millimeter wave 5G uh, are time multiplexed. So this is so-called TDD. 
Uh, and in the picture, you can see the blue squares, they indicate downlink transmissions, and the red, uh, they indicate uplink transmissions. Uh, and then the, the axis is, is uh, divided in pine like this. Uh, and uh, today's TDD frame structures, that's the, how you separate the, the uh, uplink and the downlink, uh, they are uh, designed for mobile broadband services, um, I would say. Uh, and, and, and these services are typically more downlink heavy, uh, indicated by the DL for the blue, and uh, they have less resources for the uplink or UL uh, transmissions. So, so this is uh, how a typical uh, TDD frame stru structure is, is uh, designed today. Uh, most of the blue box, most of the boxes are blue, so there is more downlink resources. Uh, now, without going into too much of the details, you can see that uh, the red uplink transmission opportunities are more frequent. So if you look at the 2.5 millisecond interval in the picture, you can see that there is one opportunity for uplink transmissions with a mid-band uh, spectrum, and there are four uh, uh, with, uh, with a high band. So more, more frequent access to uplink transmissions. Uh, and uh, if we summarize, uh, besides having more bandwidth available, uh, millimeter wave has, has some further benefits. Uh, so due to this fact that you have more frequent access to the uplink, and, and, and this is also due to the larger uh, subcarrier spacing, uh, uh, the radio part of the latency is, is lower. Uh, you have contribution from, from other things uh, like queuing, for instance, that is not uh, affected the same way, but uh, at least you can uh, lower uh, the latency over the radio part. Uh, the shorter wavelength also allows for more elaborate antenna solutions and more efficient connectivity. Uh, and uh, for the same reason, the, the shorter wavelength also, though, that the propagation losses are higher. And this is good uh, if you want to create a well isolated network uh, and, and avoid interference to and from surrounding networks. Uh, so uh, having an high band network indoors would be would be good from that perspective. On the other hand, uh, propagation may also be challenging for the coverage, let's say inside a factory. Uh, so special attention is is obviously needed for the deployment. So that is a small, uh, uh, small con here, uh, small drawback. Uh, and finally, there are um, a few markets already now considering to allocate parts of the millimeter wave spectrum for local licensing and, and for industry use. So it's, it's still early days. Uh, there are not so many millimeter wave networks out there. Um, most devices are not really intended uh, for, for industrial use, in particular the millimeter wave uh, ones. But uh, it is really interesting to see the potential and, and we're trying to evaluate that in, in this project. And I think I hand back to you, Ogi. Yes, I would just like to conclude uh, saying that uh, or reflect a bit on the on the on the status of the work. So, uh, all the three use cases uh, they have been developed and they have been uh, tested uh, uh, both uh, over uh, 5G networks uh, uh, in Westeros at AV premises, but also uh, the the main test bed uh, at uh, Shista Smart Factory of Ericsson. And uh, that now we are we are working on uh, um, uh, evaluating uh, uh, 5G for uh, for all these uh, use cases, so there we are particularly uh, looking, uh, trying to uh, uh, gather insights on on how how 5G can support uh, 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 these three use cases, uh, both from the wireless connectivity perspective, but also from having a, a, a localized on-premise uh, edge uh, uh, um, uh, with computing resources. Uh, uh, and uh, may, I would also like to use the opportunity to invite all of you listening in to actually uh, check out uh, the the, uh, the website of the project, uh, uh, look look into the deliverables. Uh, we also have a, a planned uh, uh, open trial day uh, coming up, uh, probably in April. So we all would also like to use this opportunity to uh, for you to ask you to 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 join this event as well. So uh, thank you so much for listening. Thank you uh, for both. I think we are now going to the second part. And I would immediately hand over then to 
Diels and Bart. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so welcome also from my side. Welcome uh, from Aachen. So we are broadcasting live from the Fraunhofer IPT shop floor. That's why we are using masks. I hope you can understand as well. Um, so uh, the 5G industry campus Europe, what is it? Um, the 5G industry campus Europe is actually a large scale uh, industrial 5G research infrastructure. So it's uh, composed of uh, different 5G indoor networks in uh, three different shop floors. The town of IPT today here is one of them. And in total, we are covering 8,000 square meters of shop floor, which are fully equipped with different machines and uh, robots. And uh, furthermore, uh, besides the shop floors, we also have a 5G outdoor network of approximately one square kilometer on the campus of our University of Aachen, which you can see a little bit uh, in the illustration in the background. Um, the network is set up um, both as a 5G non standalone architecture and as a 5G standalone architecture. So we started with 5G NSA and then uh, later also integrated SA. So that's two different APNs which we run in parallel. And uh, the network is, uh, of course, operated in a spectrum of 3.7 to 3.8 gigahertz. And there is also an anchor band for the 4G uh, part at the end. 40, uh, where my colleague Bart will explain later what it's, uh, how it's set up. Um, the 5G industry campus Europe is one of the uh, 5G model regions of the German government, and we receive funding uh, from the Federal Ministry of Transport and Future Infrastructures. So besides the Brown of IPT, there is also two other research institutes involved, the WZL, which is the Laboratory of Machine Food for Production Engineering, and the FIR is the uh, research Institute on Industrial Management, uh, network supplier and partner, uh, and especially partner also for this testbed, the FFG is here testbed with Ericsson, and furthermore, we are supported by the IT Center of the University, uh, who own the fiber network, which we use to connect the different sites. So what are we using this 5G infrastructure uh, for? So we're using this for joint uh, research, uh, for industrial academic collaboration. So we invite companies to collaborate with us uh, to test out uh, our use case on, at, on an early stage, uh, especially uh, for the companies who are, let's say, reluctant on uh, investing uh, money into uh, 5G infrastructure or who want to test 5G in a relevant environment like uh, an industrial shop floor. What are the applications we are addressing on the 5G in the of Europe? In total, uh, we have different application areas, uh, ranging from mobile robotics, uh, which is uh, similar to what uh, Augie and Peter just, um, just uh, presented on. And furthermore, uh, also we look at logistics with cases, uh, for what everybody knows, the HTTP spaces. And then furthermore, we look at process monitoring, especially in machining. And uh, as well, um, uh, we use uh, we develop smart sensors and operate them while. Uh, furthermore, uh, so on top of 5G, we look at uh, cross-site related uh, research questions like cross-site data processing and the sharing of data and so-called data economy platform. Okay, so. I try to speak a little bit louder. Uh, oops, you can hear me better now. Uh, so the 5G AC test that at the 5G Music Campus Europe. Uh, I'll explain briefly uh, about it, what it's what it's about. Uh, so the objective the objective of this uh, test that activity is first of first of all to set up a 5G non-public network. Um, and furthermore, to implement two different industrial use cases. Uh, uh, one is a 5G multi-center platform for process uh, monitoring and machining, and uh, also for condition monitoring uh, for the machines itself. Um, and furthermore, um, another center system is 5G acoustic emission measurement, which is being used for the monitoring of school conditions. Uh, and furthermore, uh, which is also a relevant um, question is here, how to synchronize data coming from different sources. For example, 
um, data sources like the five G based sensors, but also the machine tools, uh, which also are a data source for us. <coughs> and then, last but not least, um, uh, another objective is to validate all the use cases um, and uh, see how it works. Um, so the um, uh, this testbed is also part of the European project 5G Smart, which is being funded on the framework of the Horizon 2020 program. Testbed members are Ericsson, Crown of IPG, Ublots, and Marpos. So if we look, have a look at the use cases, uh, you see on the left uh, yeah, a uh, representation of one typical use case when it comes to wireless uh, process monitoring. So we start with the machine. With the workpiece being manufactured, then we apply wireless sensors. Uh, the wireless sensor systems also have different ways of integrating uh, functionalities from the signal processing, like the amplification, filtering, and so on. Uh, but furthermore, uh, the sensor platforms also um, can generate the data packages. Uh, for example, UDP data packages with different, different package sizes, which are being then uh, transmitted via a 5G transceiver, which is typically attached via Ethernet. Uh, the data are then transmitted uh, to an edge, on premise edge cloud, which is being used for, um, for the uh, signal or data processing and for generating a feedback, uh, which is going back to the machine tool or to record the data for the digital twin. So, how the uh, 5G infrastructure is set up, uh, will be explained by my colleague Bart. Yes, good afternoon. Um, my name is Bart Miller from uh, Ericsson. I hope the voice quality is uh, sufficient now. If not, uh, please let me know. So as Niels already showed on the, um, the picture a couple of slides ago, the test that we have at the Crown Oak IPP is part of a bigger setup, which is called the 5G Industry Campus Europe. And that one consists of an outdoor network and three indoor networks. The outdoor network itself, um, or the entire network, is predominantly an NSA network um, using the industry spectrum that is available in um, Germany of 100 megahertz uh, between 3.7 and 3.8 uh, gigahertz. And since we're talking NSA, of course, we need an, uh, an anchor band in LTE. And for that, we have um, a small um, piece of spectrum, 20 megahertz um, on band 40. So that is in uh, the 2.3 gigahertz range. Outdoor assets, um, we have four different um, radio sites, combined 4G and 5G. And with those um, four sites, we cover the entire um, campus area, which is approximately one square kilometer in size. Um, then if we have a look at the indoor um, sites, just to give you a quick idea, we're talking about three shop floors um, full of machines. Um, as you can hear, there is some background noise. Um, so the shop floors are really full of machines and uh, creates not so pleasant um, radio conditions um, or from time to time a bit of a challenge. In total, um, we cover around 8,000 square meters. And um, we do that also with um, the radio dot pairs that um, Peter already showed in his presentation. And I will also have some nice images of the oversized smoke detectors um, coming up in a, in a bit. Um, depending, of course, on the size um, of the shop floor we have to cover, um, we have something between four and eight radio dot pairs per shop floor. The smallest one being four pairs and uh, the biggest one which we are at now here at uh, Crown Oak IPT uses um, eight radio dot pairs. Um, how is everything connected? If, if you want the Crown Oak IPT in this case, as you can see as well, um, is, is a main, is a core site. And they do the user data management. Um, they are also the entry point for the outdoor or the data coming from the outdoor network to be routed into the network of the Aachen University IT Center, which you can see here on the, um, in the middle of the screen. If you now look a bit closer at what the infrastructure of the testbed consists of, um, I use some illustrations, um, gives a better impression of, um, of the hardware. To start from, uh, from the top, 
I said, we have an NSA network, so we need a 4G um, coverage. We do that with the 4G dots. They connect um, via typical um, Ethernet cable, actually. Uh, Top 6A or um, better cables are used, so no special RF cables um, are needed. To so a so-called indoor radio units, we have those for 4G and, of course, and for the, the 5G um, NR. Um, the next step is then the indoor units are connected to the baselands. From the baselands, we go to the to the router 6K, which also acts as a as a switch if you want, um, connecting the the RAN, the radio access network, to the uh, to the NSA core. Another important purpose that this router is um, fulfilling is, of course, making sure that the data that is generated in the network, be it from the from the sensors or from other applications, reaches in the, the fastest possible way the local shop floor um, IT. That is why we decided on each of the indoor shop floors that I showed in the previous pictures to have um, dedicated breakouts so we don't have to route the data to an entire um, campus network um, in order to have a lower or better latency. Just to give you some, some figures, um, you see them here on the lower part of the screen. Um, we're talking about a hole which is a, a bit over 90 meters um, long and has a width of approximately 30 meters. And the dots, um, you see them with the yellow um, dots, they represent a dot pair, are approximately 20 meters um, apart. With that setup, um, we achieved figures in the, the order of magnitude of an uh, 8 millisecond latency. Downlink values, of course, it depends a bit on where you are in the network, close to a machine or even inside a milling chamber. 914 megabits and uplink um, around 85 megabits. There is some more information on that. If you want, um, you can uh, have a look at the, the article that's where the link is shown here. But now I think we can talk a lot, but the interesting thing is, and, and that is why we are here and on the shop floor, is um, I would hand over now to Niels and he will give you a live demo of what has been developed in uh, in this test bed. But thank you for your attention. Okay, so um, welcome back. Um, we are now here at the at the demonstration area uh, in the middle of our shop floor. So perhaps you can hear in the background uh, the sound of the uh, If the noise cancelling is not too, too harsh. Um, I'd like to um, explain a little a bit about one of our use cases, which we implement in the five smart projects as a big part of the 5G AC and testbed activities. So let's have a look at this. It's a conventional cutting tool, which is being used, uh, for example, for milling operations. And so part of this uh, activity is milling. It supports that you uh, need to monitor the two condition cutting edge. Uh, determining the quality of the, the whole process, also the and um, so what you typically do is, um, in order to estimate uh, how much uh, tool where you can afford or how long you can use the tool, is that you either estimate um, the tool lifetime or you can monitor it. Um, monitoring the tool condition prevents you from exchanging the tool too early. And uh, one way to monitor this good condition is uh, acoustic emission measurements, which you can see here. This is a conventional acoustic emission measurement probe from uh, SFM and Marcos. And uh, then we have a 5G based uh, version of this kind of uh, measurement system. Uh, so, how it works, we have a, a high um, uh, sampling rate uh, measurement uh, of the acoustic emission. Um, so the sampling rate here is one megahertz, which is really high. And uh, for the purpose of the signal processing, we need an FPGA uh, because of the high data load. Uh, the FPGA calculates um, the FFT, the fast forward transformation of the signal. The signal has been preconditioned by a certain PCB. And then we generate data packages, which are then being transmitted by a conventional um, 5G router, uh, then data are being transmitted via our 5G network and then being handed over um, to our shop floor uh, local area network. And then uh, in our case, uh, 
Uh, measurement data are being sent to an SPPC, which is here uh, in this uh, stand. Then we plot measurement data uh, on the screen just to explain uh, a little bit um, the data are coming to our network. Uh, let's have a look how it looks like uh, when we induce some measurement signal. So here we have a, um, a drill, a conventional drill. Uh, this is a worn out tool, so we have uh, artificially worn it out and grinded it. So it will uh, create some, some ugly noise. Um, so if we now hit the, to the work piece, um, hopefully you can hear as well. Um, this is actually the interesting uh, fingerprint of each of the cutting edges. What you can then do is to detect any uh, artifacts uh, that you can see in the pattern. So on the y axis, we have the spectrum so from 25 kilohertz, and the NFT already regulated by the sensor on the system. Then we have the time axis, the water the plot. And uh, by uh, this kind of solution, we can detect uh, any critical incidents. For example, if the cutting edge breaks, then we we have a spike in a certain situation. Or if the whole cutting tool, especially for pin tools, they break and you will detect it instantly, then you typically want to react immediately uh, to draw back the tool, uh, either exchange it to a fresh tool or stop the whole process. And that's why we need, uh, we need this very low latency. And um, so, how do you deliver exactly that? Later, uh, right? I can add a bit the second bits. So, nice. You have seen the map frequency went over. Megabits is quite a break. But the latency is actually critical. And we have the overall end to end latency to the efficient endpoints with critical signal to the reaction time of the machine. That way, we do not want to waste. Um, too much time just because of the communication. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, Niels, are we, Bart, are you done then with yours? Yes, we are. Finished, good, very good, because we have also several questions. Some of them were answered in between. Then I would go, we go to this session question and answers. And uh, I will read through and uh, some were coming up at the part one presentation, then from Peter and Onion, uh, and uh, some will come later. So let's start with, I would say, question to, to Peter and Onion. The first one is about uh, the hardware. So I said, what hardware and which functions regarding 5G release is used? So release 15, 16, um, and uh, which performance can be achieved? I think partly was shown. And uh, especially the latency in the UL seek use case. So the, the latency which was shown later, I think, in the second part. So we'll would give it first to Peter and, and uh, Onion. Uh, yes, so I think uh, in terms of hardware, uh, I think that was uh, in the presentation. So we have millimeter wave radio, uh, we have uh, uh, the, the, the base bands, uh, uh, those are all uh, uh, commercial Ericsson products uh, generally available. Uh, so, so nothing strange there. Uh, the software is based on uh, 3DPP release, six, uh, release 15. Um, uh, the, the software is uh, updated quarterly. So uh, the, the the content and and functionality is is sort of uh, continuously improved as well. Uh, what else? We had a question on the performance. Uh, yes, so we can uh, uh, on on a high level we can say you you saw the figures that uh, Bart was showing for the millimeter wave uh, uh, network in uh, in Aachen, and then we can say that we're a little bit better on uh, the um, uh, on the millimeter wave in Chista. so we're we're measuring uh, um, a bit below 10 milliseconds uh, I would say round trip time so eight nine milliseconds in that range mm -hmm. good 
Then I would go to the second question, or the second was already answered, was about the bands which you both have shown, uh, which bands are used. Uh, the second one then, which is not answers about the first presentation. Again, uh, the question is if it's understood correctly that positioning is using currently uh, LiDAR and or camera. And the question is what about 5G positioning features? Can you give an outlook there? And uh, do you plan to implement this maybe later in the test bed or in the real case? Mm -hmm. Maybe better I can I can start with this one. Uh, uh, I mean yes, uh, uh, I think it was a question asked by Lisa, so that that's a correct and the understanding. So we are not using five G radio positioning because in in this case uh, we have we have a, a mobile robot platform uh, which doesn't use any 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 uh, uh, magnetic stripes or any 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 uh, uh, path uh, uh, already uh, um, uh, pre marked on the floor. Uh, and for for instance, for this for this docking uh, uh, feature where we park uh, the mobile robot next to the uh, workstation with fixed arm, uh, there we actually need uh, uh, precision uh, uh, on the on the on the scale of centimeters, even even below a centimeter. Uh, but uh, of course, I mean uh, regarding Outlook, uh, 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 as 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 5G radio positioning uh, is more and more accurate. I guess this could be a, a good complement uh, regard uh, as as a source of uh, positioning information uh, uh, next to uh, different cameras and other localization techniques. Uh, can I can I uh, sure. complement that? Uh, so uh, uh, regarding 5G positioning uh, uh, for the for the lab uh, for the smart factory in Shista, uh, I would say there are no plans. Uh, the 5G positioning requires that you can. Uh, I mean, it's it's a sort of a triangulation between different uh, uh, different uh, uh, base stations. So it requires you, you you can see a few cells, uh, and since we have only one uh, cell, a single cell uh, network in the in the Shista smart factory, I, I think we will we will not uh, go for that. Uh, in, well, not not in the foreseeable future. Uh, maybe if uh, Bart wants to comment, uh, you have a few more radio dots in uh, in Aachen, so maybe that is an opportunity. Yeah, sure. Um, well, I can say in the test bed itself, we uh, don't know if we have direct plans in uh, here on this site at IPT, but definitely we are exploring opportunities of um, doing trials with 5G precise indoor positioning um, here at the campus. Timeline is still a bit early to, to say, but um, I, I would say that we have something to start with uh, this year. And, and may, maybe we should also say that uh, the five, 5G positioning, uh, the, the resolution would not be sufficient for the for the uh, uh, use case with 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 the AGV traveling in the factory. So I mean, uh, uh, where you need the mil millimeter or or even centimeter resolution, then that uh, will not not in the initial release system will not be possible. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you. Yeah, and I think it's anyhow a feature of later releases of 3GPP or planned, let's say. Um, okay, the other question was about the website was answered, so you can find it in the answer with uh, 5gsmart.eu. You can find all the details. The next one was again, uh, but this was already coming in for the second part, but uh, yeah, maybe you can start then, Bart or Niels, about the spectrum again. What is the purpose of the 2.3 gigahertz anchor? On top of the 3.7 gigahertz for the campus network. You want to take it, Salah? Take it, Niels. Well, um, as I was explaining, we we are talking about a so-called non-standalone network. Non-standalone means it does not run just on 5G NR. Um, it requires an LTE or a dedicated signaling connection for the UE to register with the network, etc. This. Pure signaling in our case is handled over the LTE, this small portion of 20 megahertz. The actual data is predominantly or primarily transported over the, the 5G spectrum, the 100 megahertz, um, 3.7 to 3.8. Should there be an issue for whatever reasons with the 5G portion, we can of course also transfer then lower amounts of, uh, of data 
over the 4G network. When we move to an SA, a standalone network, then the necessity of having an LTE band falls away, and then we are just using the 5G NR portion of um, of the spectrum we have allocated here. Yeah. That's that's correct. I I also want to add from the from the user point of view, this also makes sense because if we look at the early versions of 5G UEs, uh, it cannot be guaranteed that uh, both of them work directly on 5G SA. Uh, typically, 5G NSA works works better, uh, and you need additional configurations uh, for them to run on 5G SA. And if we look at uh, migration also to millimeter wave, then we know that uh, the devices that you can get today uh, for millimeter wave spectrum, uh, all of them run on NSA still. So that's why it makes sense to run both in parallel. And for us, it's just uh, entering a different APN. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see. Uh, we have some more questions, not much time left, but let's see. So the next one was, uh, did you look into a run setup with micro radios instead of the dots, the dot setups? So micro radios instead of the um, dots. I'm, I'm pretty sure that our um, radio planner looked at all the alternatives when um, the network was being designed. I was not part of that phase, uh, unfortunately, but you, you always have to look at what products are available in what bands um, at what point in time. And then you do simulations. Um, given the circumstances here, as I was saying, we have uh, quite some, uh, I'm just looking around here, quite some impressive uh, metal structure casings. And um, the simulations just showed that based on the radiation patterns of the dots, um, the fact that they are radiating omnidirectional um, just provided the best coverage um, throughout the shop floor um, surface. Yeah, and uh, if we look at uh, later uh, localization use cases, uh, we think that um, localization might benefit from uh, distributed antenna systems like the, like the radio dot system. Okay, thank you. Let's see if we can get to the last two. Um, next one was about the, the use case with the AMR, AGV, which functions are executed on the cloud or edge cloud uh, and which are running on the robot. So. Yes, uh, I get to this one. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, thanks, Uwe. So, uh, in, in in short, uh, the complete navigation stack uh, for uh, for a mobile robot platform runs on Edge Cloud. So, this includes uh, global planning, uh, uh, local planning, uh, also with uh, with collision avoidance. Uh, we also run mobile robot localization uh, on Edge Cloud, while uh, uh, there are low level uh, motion execution functions uh, uh, are kept on board uh, the mobile platform. So, for instance, uh, inverse schematics and uh, odometry and wheels control, of course. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe we take the last one. Uh, that's an, maybe an easy one, or let's say the question Do you have any plan for supporting PDA type? Of course, you mentioned there the mobile phone. And in future others, so PDA type devices. I don't know if uh, depends on who is providing this PDA. <laughs> is um, there any? I can answer it. So, um, uh, so from the use case point of view, uh, of course, we look at uh, PDAs like uh, tablets or smart glasses, if that's uh, what you mean with PDA type mm -hmm. devices. Uh, so we have uh, one project uh, looking at augmented reality for assembly tasks uh, to use the PDA as a supporting device uh, for the for the worker, uh, and that uh, of course uh, is leveraged by a, a low latency communication become, because then the rendering may be more fluent. Um, and uh, another um, project we are um, exploring PDAs uh, PDA type devices. Um, where we want to display live machine data, uh, uh, for example, coming from one of the sensors we have just demonstrated, uh, to display them um, on a smart glass uh, for a service, uh, for, for a field service uh, technician. Um, then, but of course, uh, for this kind of trials, we need to um, we need to use converters. But at the end, um, yeah, the main questions here are: what are the interfaces and what are the um, communication protocols in order to have an end-to-end -end communication from, for example, the sensor to the smart glass. Maybe, maybe I can add um, one two sentences before time is up. I guess um, 
a non-public um, network does not limit the type of devices you use. So any device that supports the, the preconditions for registering the network is able to connect to the network, whether it's a smartphone or PDA, a, a router, an industrial router, as long as it supports some things like typically we use um, so-called test PLMN ID of 99999. If that is working, if the band combinations that we are using are supported by the device vendor, if there is no locking or binding to certain band combinations from a public vendor, a public operator, then any device can connect. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah, I would say thank you very much as we are uh, at the end, I would say, for all the questions for sure to the uh, participants and uh, especially to all of you for the very good uh, information updates and, and uh, now for the Q&A. And uh, yeah, we are happy to have you here and we are already looking for the next one uh, in exactly one month, March the 9th. And we have then the next web seminar following up on, on the test beds done in 5G ACA with even three sessions, uh, as you can read here. Registration is open as usual, so please feel free to join again, promote this, and we are happy uh, to join again. So thank you to our panelists as well. And, uh, with this, I would end this web seminar. Thank you. Thank you.